in critical race theorist Cheryl Harris, the way the courts have protected whiteness, and by whiteness here I mean that privilege gap or that power gap, is by treating whiteness as a type of property and applying property law to it. As with property owners in general, owners of whiteness have the, the exclusive right of possession of the property, they have the right to use and enjoy this property fully, and they have the right, the absolute right to exclude. The exclusive rights of possession means that the property of whiteness belongs to white people only, no one else can claim it. Only whites can extend the privilege of whiteness to others. The right to, quote, use and enjoy, unquote, fully all of the rights and privileges of whiteness specifically refers to enjoying the unearned, privilege, the, the unearned privileges, power differentials that reinforce white supremacy and the subordination of non-whites. This right is not about sort of cultural expression, but about the value of this gap between um, whiteness and non-whiteness. The absolute right to exclude means that whites have no obligation to share the unearned privileges of whiteness, and non-whites have no inherent right to them. In addition, the courts consider property owners' expectations before making changes. Um, this is one of the insights of Harris's work, uh, before making any changes to the racial status quo. So in practical terms, this <coughs> means that whites have the right to expect the racial status quo to be preserved, even though inequality is embedded within it. Now, while the idea of whiteness as property explains how the courts work to preserve a power differential between whites and others, interest convergence explains why apparent racial progress occurs when and how it does. According to Derek Bell, who is considered the father of critical race theory, specific advances for black, indigenous, and people of color occur only when specific material or non-material interests of whites are served by that progress. Bell's understanding is based on his work with the Brown versus Board of Education and other legal efforts to desegregate US schools. Interest convergence suggests that public health interventions targeting racism or disparities are more likely to, su to succeed if, in addition to documenting the in inequities, they understand and account for white's interests with respect to addressing them in a particular time and context. So by defining white's interests clearly, interventions might, may either build on overlapping interests between whites and non-whites, or strive to circumvent or overcome those that might be barriers. <coughs> interest convergence also explains how the unique needs of communities may diverge from those of researchers or public health professionals um, who are working on their behalf. So in another set of uh, Bell's work, he's looking not necessarily at racial and ethnic differences in interest convergence, but at what does it mean to be a member of a community working, uh, a member of a particular community in terms of your identity, and working on behalf of that community, but not Re reside as deeply in the margins as others in that community do? To what extent do my interests as a representative of that community reflect or not those of those of the, uh, of the, excuse me, of the other members of that community who live more deeply within the margins? There are a number of critical race methods that might be employed based on um, both these constructs and others. I've highlighted a few here. To center in the margins is to establish a discourse based on the perspectives of people who live in the margins of society. To use first person voice is a strategy that critical race theorists use in order to draw attention to the fact that much of the work we do is not bias-free, even when we define it as objective. To assess our a priori biases, 
um, is to draw attention to the subjectivity um, that we bring to the work that we do. Some critical race theorists see as part of their method becoming involved with community engagement through direct action. A strong component of critical race theory is, as a method, is to tell stories in response to what the mainstream of the field has provided as a dominant narrative. That's counter storytelling. And an important uh, method used, an important multiple method strategy is to critique the canon using a critical race lens to expose implicit or unacknowledged ways in which racial, racialization informs what we believe to be colorblind or race neutral um, dimensions of the field. <coughs> and here I just want to draw attention to the importance of centering in the margins, which means to recognize first that there is a margin and that there are perspectives rooted in the margins. Those perspectives include not only understandings <coughs> about the adversities that communities face, but also the sources of resilience and strength that exist there. So how might um, a consideration with critical, research, critical race theory benefit health equity research. Um, I believe that it would help us to define relevant populations more accurately, improve the rigor of research, especially because race is used almost automatically in our projects without any major engagement with what exactly it represents, generate more meaningful and nuanced understandings of seemingly uh, you know, um, intuitive disease patterns or racialized disease patterns, illuminate ways racism is operating, both within the field and within uh, society. So much of our research on racism is focused on the ways that racism affects disease out here. How can we simultaneously examine the ways in which racism is working within the field? It would also expand the types of approaches that can be used in empirical research. Some of the questions we would need to ask on populations, race and ethnicity include what is race? Um, is it an administrative category? Is it a marker of privilege, an exposure, an immutable heritable trait? Is it essentially socioeconomic status? Is it a proxy for? Um, we don't know what, but a proxy for. Um, is it imposed upon us or is it chosen? Similarly, what is ethnicity? Is that an administrative category? Is it chosen? Is that distinct from the ways in which race might be chosen? Um, and is it an indicator of certain social distance from full citizenship? How is it related to race? <coughs> Critical race theory informed <coughs> questions about the field of public health include how do racialized assumptions inform research? Um, how do the field's norms help consolidate white privilege? How do the field's norms remarginalize minority perspectives? How do, they, um, how do the field's norms model equity or not? How do the field's racial approaches inform those of the broader society? Um, whose perspectives matter? And here, attention to power is is fundamental. And as we conclude in the book, quote, racism is woven into the fabric of our nation, and the field of public health is part of that fabric. And so that's why we're concerned both with the ways in which it operates in society and within the field. So ultimately, critical race theory asks us to shift the focus of our work from studying race to studying and addressing racism. And this entails reframing what we might consider risk factors, risk conditions, or exposures away from individuals 
towards the social determinants of health and seeing racism as a social determinant of health. Um, this work is challenging as racism is complex and multifaceted. It includes direct as well as indirect pathways. It's influenced by historical and legacy racism. It reflects social ordering in society. It operates across and within all socioecologic levels. I um, was asked to share a little bit from the book, and so I would like to just read a, a couple of excerpts. I'll start with an excerpt from the introduction, and then I'd like to read what we're calling Notes from the Battlefield, just to say a word or two about the structure of the book. It's organized with uh, four ma five major uh, units. Is it four? <laughs> we had to change it. <coughs> I was right, it's five. Um, where we ask, you know, is racism a public health issue? How does racism affect health? What do we do about it? Are there group-specific experiences? Um, meaning, for instance, various racialized groups. And where do we go from here? In addition to the sort of science and the translation pieces of it, as well as the practice recommendations, we include some interviews with one with David Williams and one with um, Miss Loretta, Dr. Loretta Jones from Healthy African American Families. The interview with with uh, Miss Loretta um, revealed a lot of pain that she had experienced in her struggle for health equity, and so we have named these little brief excerpts notes from the battlefield. So let me just start with this. Um, introduction piece. One challenge the field of public health continues to, to confront is that of health disparities or health inequities. A growing body of evidence suggests these are driven in large part by racism. However, the field has yet to provide public health professionals with a concrete set of tools for tackling the health implications of racism. Public health has had a long fraught relationship with racism. Historically, public health agencies and officials barred minorities from joining certain professional societies and attending certain schools. They advanced racist ideas that attributed some stigmatized diseases to one's nationality, ethnicity, or race, and supported the use of those ideas to justify limiting the number of Chinese, Irish, Jewish, Italian, Mexican, and other immigrants who could become U.S. citizens. The field also participated in, or was complicit in, inflicting historical trauma upon indigenous populations. Understandably, this legacy contributes to mistrust of the public health and medical sectors in some communities even today. Initially, we had planned to name this book, Is It, quote, Is It Race or Racism, unquote, in reference to a historical gathering of the same name organized by a group of forward-thinking health equity advocates and held at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 1991. As described in detail by William Bill Jenkins and colleagues in Chapter 2, the meeting agenda was a radical one, through which the organizers sought to force the field of public health to rethink its approaches to studying race, ethnicity, and disease. They called for researchers to stop treating race as the root cause of death and disease in racial ethnic minority communities and focus instead on addressing the racialized forms of oppression to which these communities are chronically exposed. Although the title no longer includes an explicit reference to that foundational gathering, the meeting nevertheless <coughs> informs this book in at least two important ways. First, it serves as a reminder that public health professionals have been fighting racism and its health implications for decades. The publication of this book documents and extends that anti-racism work um, that those organizers were doing into the 21st century. In 2019, researchers can name racism explicitly and measure its health effects empirically without a major reason to fear reprisal. But this opportunity is only possible because some of the people who came before us 
including many whose names we will never know, selflessly risk their careers and livelihoods to push our field in this direction. Secondly, the meeting serves as a guide that informs the scope of the book and its social justice orientation. The organizers of that meeting urged the field to move boldly beyond narrow racial and ethnic comparisons. The chapters in this book heed that call by focusing squarely on the racism-related systems of inequality that produce and sustain health inequities. This note from the battlefield, um, we named the personal is political, with this uh, footnote. The personal is political is an affirming and, and empowering statement that black and other feminists have been making since at least the 1970s. Mm -hmm. I thought of it recently, I, Chandra, thought of it recently, while listening to Miss Loretta describe an incident that happened to her years ago. To say the personal is political clarifies that incidents of gendered violence are not mere private acts directed at individuals. They are, in fact, common threats intended to keep women and girls or other whole classes of people in their subordinate place. To recognize the personal as political redirects our efforts from adapting to or coping with such indignities toward building movements that can eradicate the underlying social injustices. Ms. Loretta understood this as she recounts it, the offense and insult she suffered personally during the civil rights era helped catalyze her commitment to fight for the dignity of others. She reclaimed her own dignity in an instant. Those who sought to break her then might shudder to know just how valuable their acts of hatred were for the social justice warrior, uh, excuse me, for the social justice work she continued to do. So that's the footnote. Let me just read what she shared with me. Ever since before the Black Panther Party, I used to go down south into Mississippi in the 60s to help people learn how to vote, voter registration. I worked with Reverend Lawson, with Martin Luther King. They talked about how important it was that everybody understand what is in the best interest of everybody and what you need to do to make it easy for everybody. And the hardest thing was when I saw the KKK. And I realized for the first time in my life that these people hate me. I had this one white woman, and I guess I still carry this in my body. She's spitting in my face. I remember it so well because she did that slimy thing, and she did it right in my face. And I couldn't hit her, and I couldn't say anything to her because they didn't want us to go to jail or anything. But it hurt me so bad, and I promised myself that they were going to work for me. So um, I want to uh, acknowledge both Dr. Bill Jenkins and Ms. Loretta, um, just warriors in this health equity movement for many, many, many years. And I urge each of us in this room to continue to take up the charge uh, that they left us. Thank you. officials can be very influential um, in shaping the resources that are available and the nature of those resources at the local, state, and federal levels. Um, even those um, elected officials who are not your own representatives but who serve on committees um, at the federal level 
um, might be um, you know, open to encouraging support, providing support, um, et cetera, for, for the work that we want to do and that many of them believe needs to be done. Yeah. Other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, it's a great talk. Thank you for coming. I really liked how you framed the issues, and you also talked about thinking about the assets that marginalized communities have. Yeah. And as people are talking more about racism, I feel like there's a risk of kind of reifying race in another way, where people are still using variables for race and saying it just represents racism without thinking about all the other factors that you know, bind people together or contribute to health outcomes. And so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. As people are more explicitly talking about racism, which is good, but sometimes still just conflating it with racial categories. So that's an excellent question. My thinking on this has to do with the ways in which we tend to default back to the sort of reification of biology, um, uh, of race. And I think the risk with a lot of the interpersonal discrimination work is to treat discrimination as a characteristic of racialized individuals or groups. And one way I think um, we can push back against that is to remember that we are focusing on racialization, which applies to both um, whites or other dominant groups, as well as those who are marginalized. And I really am trying to push towards studying that relational dimension rather than studying the group, the marginalized group, because that tends to lead to the treatment of that group as just having this particular characteristic. Hi, Dr. Ford. Thank you so much. That was um, an incredible talk. Um, so I'm wondering, do you think there is a responsible way to talk about things like APOL L1 or um, information that is being discussed now about possible genetic determinants of um, or contributors to increased risk of diseases like hypertension and chronic kidney disease among people of color, given that genetics is a biological concept, race, race is a social construct, and they're kind of, they seem to be being conflated in a way that is at times counterproductive <coughs> to a discussion about health equity and the social determinants of health. Oh, yes. All of it? Okay. Um, should, I, should I go to a mic? Yeah. So there are mics all over the place, oh. but I think your question is about research into the genetics and race. Yeah. And how is there a response? Yes. Yeah. So um, as I understand the question, the question is, can we talk about genetics and race um, responsibly? Um, and part of what I hear in the question, and let me know if I'm mistaken, is a reluctance to relinquish a, a, a connection or a, you know to the genetics component of that. Is, is that part of what I'm hearing? I'm perceiving a reluctance to relinquish the genetic component of it in some of the ways that I'm hearing it talked about. So my, there are two ways I think about the question. Um, one is from the perspective of someone who's interested in public health. Um, which has limited resources and focused on large populations. And uh, as you can hear from where I'm going, it's a matter of cost-benefit analysis in terms of resources. Where might our efforts be, you know, better placed? Um, and I'm not sure that thinking at the most micro and often most expensive level is a better investment than addressing the social determinants of health. So that's one. The second um, point I would say there are a number of historians of science who are looking at these very questions and um, what they would caution is that the technologies of any contemporary moment are the ones that inform how we think about race at that time. Mm -hmm. So the question now is about you know, techno genetics based on the technologies we have now, mm -hmm. but that question differs very little from the questions that people asked in prior periods, mm -hmm. but using the, the technologies that they had at those times. So in short, I would be very cautious about um, 
moving forward in a gen with the genetics work without a greater critical analysis of the racialization of that work. Um, so acknowledging that there's a wide variety in how public health professionals are trained and that all of that seems to be undercut by the competencies that are pushed out, I'm wondering how anti-racism or any of our critical race theory or public health critical race practice could be embedded into the competencies that the pro our programs are kind of based on. That's a good question that I have not thought about before. <laughs> um, Could you repeat the question, please? The question was, how can anti-racism be embedded into the curriculum and the competencies that are put forth by our accrediting bodies? So I do know that Kamara Jones, just as one person, has been involved with that accrediting process in the past. I know that there are others who are concerned with uh, racism and um, health inequities who are involved with it. I don't feel like I know enough in terms of, you know, affecting those policies for the school to be able to, um, for our, our schools to be able to um, incorporate them more systematically. There might be someone in the room like Dr. Rimsel or <laughs> Dean Reimer who could respond to that better. But thank you for the question. Thank you for your visit and your talk. My question is somewhat related. What encouragement can you give our students when I'm thinking about critical race theory and interest convergence, mm -hmm. knowing that schools of public health all across the country aren't necessarily aligned with this field, and yet we have lots of students who are interested in this and going deeper? So uh, part of what I would say is that the father of critical race theory, Derek Bell, had this orientation known as racial realism, where he personally believed racism is never going away, it's here to stay. Um, but there is liberation in the struggle itself. So it's not that I know the outcome and I am certain of it, but that I, I continue to remain invested in the struggle because through that struggle there is something to be gained. Um, I don't want to oversimplify the issue, especially for students, um, but I do think that there are organizations across the country and now across the world that are com concerned with addressing racism within the field of public health. Um, and I think that sometimes the most, we can rely on institutions for what institutions can give us, but sometimes we have to go outside the institutions for these other things. Um, as my parents would say, you can't get blood from a turnip. <laughs> so I would strongly encourage them to become involved with the National Anti-Racism Collaborative, um, Public Health Awakened, um, um, White Coats for Black Lives. There are a number of organizations. And, um, and through that to develop, and you hear what I'm saying is process matters. So through that to develop strategies that can help to sustain them over the long haul for the work that they need to do and that we need them to do. explanation or every paper that gets rejected from a top journal that's using critical race theory there's some explanation or every student that's not admitted or job candidate we don't hire like in every case when you boil it down to these individual instances that make up the accumulation of our work um, it feels hard to kind of bring the data to it and say no this is one of the cases where you know we're seeing this widespread deprioritization of um, research on disparities or, you know, deprioritization of, you know, bringing in more diverse students and what, how can we combat that in our kind of everyday lives where we're trying to bring in anti-racism but we kind of face the, the prevailing norms and the prevailing ways of doing things? Part of what I would say is that um, it's important to learn from history. So although we might feel constrained today, 
imagine how constrained Bill Jenkins and Miss Loretta felt five decades ago. And so it's important not to focus on those limits, but to just pursue what it is you're, that you're trying to do in spite of them. Um, the limits will make themselves known to you. Um, and then the other thing I would say, well actually there's two other things I would say. Um, related to that, I would, I really can't, um, you know, highlight it enough. That is the archival work that um, Dr. Schoenbach has done because it really it's in learning and seeing what other people have done that it's really encouraging, inspiring, and you get creative examples of how, how you might proceed in this time. Um, and then I guess the final thing I would say is I would only dedicate some portion <coughs> of my effort to that sort of change making because the more important thing is to do the work that you need to do right, and um, make sure that that is not stifled by trying to sort of correct the institutions or um, address these things that are really just sort of tangents in, on the path that you were trying, you know, along the path that you were not actually trying to go down that path. She was, yes. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Ford, thank you for coming and for your lovely <coughs> talk. Um, something that you said that really change the way I think about things in a tremendous way is um, how systems of oppression and the way that they interlock um, is what, if I'm getting this wrong, let me know, but that is what creates populations. Yes. And as someone who's in a program called Population Health for clinicians, uh, of what utility is it to think about health on the level of the population and what's the way I should be trying to turn towards instead? Um, can you say a little more? I want to make sure I understand your question fully. Um, I guess if the idea of the population is something that emerges from the systems of oppression, then it might not be a good way to to think about people, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's not the only way that populations are formed. Um, but in the case of intersectionality, we often hear the term intersectionality used as a way of talking about the many different labels that I myself use to define yeah. myself. But those labels reflect populations that I have been sort of assigned to. Yes. And the reason I was, the way that I was assigned to them was through the construction of populations um, through the sort of social stratification. I'm trying to keep my words, you know, smaller syllables, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You've done that all the way down. <laughs> However, the definition by Ruth Wilson Gilmore of racism is really useful. Like, if you can Google that, because yeah. it can help to um, help you think through exactly how, how that works. But we as researchers actually also play a role in constructing populations all the time. Right. You know, so, yeah. So